Faye in Karaya Samalik. Welcome to my channel. Kumama, Abala Litima, in Kachole Men. Alright, so this is gonna be the continuation of my African Weapon Collection series. This video is very special to me. I think it's gonna be my favorite one so far because I am covering a weapon that is from my direct paternal lineage, the Barasa people. This right here is a Balanta Saber, also known as Bithun. Bithun is the word for sword in Balanta. And as you can see, just from I would say the first glance, you would notice that it's very similar to my Sofa Saber, uh, which is the Manding Saber of the Mande slave warriors called the Sofa that founded a lot of the ethnic groups along the Rice Coast, Senegambia, uh, all the way down to Liberia, Sierra Leone. It's because I believe personally that this style of Saber with the frills, you know, re representing the horse, the hilt right here, how it has, has the ball at the end, you can see that. And just, just the iron work in general. And just how this blade looks, the style, the designs. I believe this is the model for any Manday inspired, any sword I'll say from the Mali Empire, from around that time of the Mali Empire. And I say that because the the Mali Empire was expanding as we know, but it also broke up into many different kingdoms. One of those kingdoms was the kingdom of Kabu or Gabu. In that kingdom, it pretty much made up of, uh, I, I, can't, I can't remember if it was Sofa, if it was Mande or Fula uh, chiefs and people. But what happened was, if you watch my Balanta video, when they came across the Brasa people in modern day Guinea-Bissau, which is where the Kabul Kingdom was trying to expand, they came across the Balanta people and they got, they got mashed up. They, their horses couldn't penetrate the, the sea coast where all of the Balanta people were, where the marshes were, because they were rice farmers and all these things. So we had a lot of the environmental factors on our side. Uh, but also what happened was with all these raids from the Gabu Kingdom, we got to pretty much, I would say, adopt some of their weaponry into the Balanta repertoire, if you will. So I believe that this sword was a, was a relic from maybe a battle that the Balanta won, and they took the sword uh, or the saber from one of the Sofa or Mande Kabu uh, generals or, or soldiers. That's my hypothesis. I'm not sure how, how true it is, but I do know that sabers, machetes, any type of weapon like this was definitely included in the Brasa culture from long time. Uh, as soon as they got access to iron, I would say, um, they started making these swords which kind of re resemble machetes by their length and just how they're wheeled. Well, you know, they're wielded like similar to, you would see like a, a machete in the field. Um, so this is made of iron, I believe. You can tell by the rust. And pretty much, I think it's iron and cowhide leather. And it's, it's a beautiful saber. The only thing I've noticed is that this part of the scabbard is missing. So the scabbard is really uh, cut off, if you will. So when you put this actual blade in, it goes through. See that? This one also, unlike my sofa saber, has uh, I would say a harness for it to be held around the shoulder like this, which I really love because I, I, I think what it was was this saber would be almost the last line of defense for any warrior. I believe you would have a shield and a spear as your first line, as your first lines of defense as far as your weaponry as a African warrior around that time or soldier. But when it came to guerrilla warfare, which was very common along um, in the Guinea-Bissau region, specifically because of the terrain, I believe that when the horsemen from the Kabul Kingdom came in, they had to, you know, demount their horses because the horses couldn't go in the marsh fields, like I said, and they were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with these 
uh, with these sabers against all the different ethnic groups they tried to conquer. Uh, so yeah, you can also see various pictures of Balanta, Lantan Dang, which are the initiated men, as well as Nyaye, which is a, a older age class of the Barasa uh, boys as they go through maturity. They always have either a knife around their neck or a machete in their hand um, just to represent that warrior spirit that we come from. But you can see the Balanta have different machetes or blades like this in various pictures. I think I'll post one just to show you. Um, but their traditional blades, it seems like, were very, very wide. Um, that's the ones they n normally use. Those are the ones they normally use in dances that are very traditional to the Barasa people. So it, that's why it mainly believe, uh, it leads me to believe that these were acquired uh, through through raids of different other ethnic groups, including the, the Mandate. The only other thing, though, that kind of has me stumped just to really rely on that hypothesis is that if you look at the end right here near the hill, it's very, very round. And it's actually, I think, made out of copper or brass. So when I did my sofa uh, sword video, that saber had more of a flat hill. Uh, and I don't think it was made out of metal. I think it was made out of leather uh, and, and basket uh, fibers, just like the rest of the, uh, the blade. The, the only blades I've ever seen that look like this, that are like Manding type sabers, that have this round brass hilt, are the Balanta ones. And I'll, po I'll post a picture of another um, Brasa saber that I saw in the auction that I couldn't get, unfortunately. I'm still, I'm still upset about that. Because you know how I am with, with these art artifacts. <laughs> Don't make me post a picture again. I'm going to post it anyway. But yeah, man, like, I always love to, to, to look at the different intricacies of different African weapons, especially ones that I descend from. So it was really a, um, a pleasure to be able to acquire this, this, uh, this saber. I want to show off some details real quick. So if you look here, you'll see that there is a few designs or indentations that look like they should be designs. And I'm not sure how well you can see them on my camera, but they kind of look like uh, they look like a sun almost, like little like scratches in a circular fashion that kind of make a circle. And I'm not sure if that's a specific uh, tribal marking or, or or what, but I see a lot of them on this saber. Especially if you look here, I don't know if you can see, oh, this one you really see. You'll see like these diamond shapes with a circle with a dot inside in each of them. I've noticed in a lot of Mande or Soninke type of art, you see that design. And I actually have a tattoo since I'm close. So it's funny because I look at it and I see those and I see these right here. <laughs> and it's almost similar. So, really and truly, I want to see if somebody, maybe from the Hama group, one of my Hama brothers, can really identify what all of these designs and symbols mean on these swords. Because it's not just the Manding Sabres. Also the Tacoba, you know, a lot of spears, a lot of shields have these designs and we don't really know what they mean to certain African uh, ethnic groups. So hopefully we can find that out. But as far as this saber goes, this Pathum, because I'm going to call it a Pathum, that's what our Grasa ancestors called it, a uh, sword in Balanta is Pathum, language lesson. <laughs> you get two for one. Anyway, so just to know that uh, a Balanta man had this in his hands, uh, no matter how he got it, it, it gives me a lot of fire. It gives me a lot of power to know that. Uh, somebody in my ancestral lineage, you know, wielded something like this. Yeah. So, this has been another installment of my African weapon collection featuring the Balanta Saber, the Balanta Fethum fight.